Are you satisfied with your understanding of sustainability? If not, like me, imagine a journey together, a pluralistic one, with innovators, startup, academia, NGO, all together looking for solution to the greatest challenge of our time. I'm Samuel Lettini, and this is The Sustainability Journey. Welcome to another episode of The Sustainability Journey, and today I'm very pleased to have an author, a change maker, who has given a wonderful contribution how we can practically, you know, work and develop strategically in our farms sustainability with a new tool, the Sustainability Scorecard. I'm very pleased to have here the co-author together with Paula Nastar, Urvashi Batnangar. Thank you so much, Urvashi, for being here. Thank you for having me. Urvashi. I read the book and it's amazing and fantastic. I learned so much and it was really a practical tool on how to embed sustainability in our farming, on how to foster and change the world. But before going there, and I'm sure everybody listening is eager too, we want to know your amazing journey. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm thrilled to speak about it. So I started my career in India and I was able to intern with a really incredible orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Uh, Matthew Verghees, um, who still practices in India. And he runs India's largest and last polio ward. And so a lot of the focus of our work was, his, of his work is a reconstructive surgery uh, for post-polio syndrome patients. And therefore a lot of my work was focused on the rehabilitation uh, side of things. However, his focus, aside from surgery, was also on, you know, the social and environmental factors that would uphold uh, his patient's wellness. And therefore, him and the hospital made a lot of investments to not only investigate the challenges that his patients were facing, but also put forth a lot of public health measures to support them. And that's how I got involved in sustainability is having interned under this incredible person's leadership. I really got a very close view and uh, into sustainability. And at the time, we didn't call it social and environmental determiners of health. And we weren't calling it uh, a triple bottom line view. Uh, it, we were just simply doing what's right. And we were focused on public health. However, since I started my career there, it was very impactful and I carried those lessons through my career. And so as I started to practice in the U.S. And I, um, or even when I got into consulting more in the strategy side of things, for me, it was very important to have a holistic perspective of a patient's journey or uh, even at the 50,000 foot level to have a holistic perspective of the population that is affected by a certain condition and how to better their outcomes. And so for me, the sustainability scorecard, while we uh, talk about a variety of industries, for me, the whole book is about healthcare and how we can uphold our wellness and planetary wellness, because our long-term health cannot be achieved without the rest of the population that we're surrounded by being healthy, so community wellness, and then environmental wellness, so that, you know, we minimize our risks and exposures to toxic chemicals. That's wonderful. This combination that I really liked in the book, the two, you and Paul, the other co-author, you come together. And I want maybe in the book, there is the wonderful way you, you met Paul and you started your journey in Yale. And then, you know, Paul Anastas, you know, you can discuss is the winner prize for Volvo and Sustainability, is the founder of Green Chemistry. How you met together in Yale and you started this journey towards sustainability and the work you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was very fortunate to have met Paul um, during my MBA. In my first year, I was a student in his class. Uh, you know, uh, as you just mentioned, Paul is the father of green chemistry. And at the School of Management, he taught a sustainability innovation class wherein he provided a methodology to incorporate the 12 principles of green chemistry into management practices. But he also talked about how to innovate by leveraging the 12 principles of green chemistry. And of course, because this was the management school, we weren't diving into the chemistry, but we, we were leveraging his 
general themes to uh, help products and processes undergo a process of innovation. And so the class was very impactful and very informative um, and really helped not only take me out of my comfort zone, but also help me approach problems uh, in a different way. Um, prior to that, I think I was always interested in a holistic approach and I always made an effort to include social and environmental determiners into whatever solution we were developing. But Paul's methodology and his approach really helped streamline my focus and efforts and really created a great deal of impact in the work that I was doing. And so I approached him and asked him how I can get more involved. And of course, since then, uh, the, the rest is history. We, um, I've been so grateful. I've been able to do uh, some publishing with him uh, related to green supply chains and health systems, and otherwise uh, get more involved in you know, the work that he does. On, with startups and firms, um, and then also write this book. And now, as you say, this book has come, you know, from the first MBA classes and the discussion, then, you know, you bring in the healthcare, bringing also the work on Green Chemistry, being the father, then together you have created this uh, wonderful and practical, as I, as I said, tool. In the book, you start discussing of the obscenity and the misser opportunity of the status quo. Can you explain a bit this and, and why you think that we can put together? I really like the sentence that you put, sustainability and profitability then put together. Absolutely. Thank you so much for mentioning this. I'd say this is really the heart of the book. This is, this is the main theme that we start with and then we kind of dive into the how for the rest of the book. But to passively accept our 21st century uh, absurdities like you know our exposure to toxic chemicals in, the, in our groundwater or air or anything like that by way of our um, robust economic activities is absurd right it's 2022 and we just think it's okay we accept that there is going to be a level of uh, lead in our cooking material there's going to be a certain level of toxic chemicals in the air we breathe every day, and that there's no place safe in the world um, where you can actually safely now drink rainwater. So all of these things are absurd that it's 2022, and we just say, well, this, that's just the way it is. That's how it's going to be. And so for all our innovation, it would be a missed opportunity if we did not act on it. Because as we say in the book, and so as Paul and I talk about in the book, the next Google or the next wave of high net worth, ultra high net worth individuals are going to be those that either create products that help mitigate climate change, or they're going to be the investors that invest in the products that will mitigate climate change. But at the end of the day, this remains humankind's most the greatest missed opportunity if we do absolutely nothing about it and we continue to persist in business as usual as if nothing has happened we continue to let all of these climate change effects impact us thank you so much urvasi as you said we need to do something i, I really like the historic part you know about the pyrrhic victory we have some transformed so much but then at the end of the day we have lost almost everything so does not make any sense to have a, such a victory if we are destroying our planet. After this, now you are stepping to the how, because we know the theory. We have discussed so many times, we know the problems, we know the risk, we know how much will be the cost of doing nothing. And we already seen the floods in Pakistan, I mean, and what we are reading today and uh, all over the world. So I want to understand what it is that you and Paul are bringing, what is the sustainability scorecard? What is new about this tool, differentiating with the other tools that they are up there in the market and then proposed by other scholars? Yeah, absolutely. So yes, you are right. Uh, we live in a scorecard rich environment and there are multiple ways to measure our impact depending on the industry and the sector and the work you're doing and things like that. And our hope with the sustainability scorecard is that this can be a tool that actually helps bring key scientific principles up 
um, into management principles so that we are actually tracking and monitoring the things that will help inform our go forward metrics will serve as a common language between industries and sectors and will help therefore unite our efforts so the scorecard is intentionally designed to be flexible of course as you mentioned you know we talk about safe degradation use of renewable inputs and things like that these are our key principles and these inform the pillars of our scorecard we break those down further in the book um, as we talk about, for example, in safe degradation, we look at bioaccumulation and things like that. But exactly the metrics that each firm or a certain industry will choose to focus on within safe degradation will be unique to that industry. Um, so we cannot hope to understand at this very moment exactly what uh, a certain firm's organizational priorities are and how they align with the key challenges in their industry or with the with the resources that they use. But what we do hope to do is provide them with a high level enough yet rigorous enough scorecard that is hopefully bringing perspectives into their measurement that they never used before. So for example, safe degradation, going back to that one uh, again, this is something that, you know, typically is not measured, but when it, as it relates to end of life metrics, we hope what we advocate for is that any firm will design such that most of their end of life products can be either upcycled or reused in another way or refurbished. However, if there is a portion that must go to the landfill, then this is a go forward approach as to how to analyze the afterlife effects of that product um, and to see in the design phase itself whether we can create any green alternatives that would help in safe degradation such that there is negligible to none impact to the surrounding community when that product does arrive in the landfill. This is how we hope that the sustainability scorecard is differentiated, is that it is rigorous yet high level. It brings new perspectives into management that previously are used, you know, sometimes in environmental assessments or otherwise, but they haven't been brought together to inform a sufficiently high level executive assessment to inform a firm's go forward approach. That is what I really like. When I was reading the book, I really like this approach, that holistic, science-based, because it's based on the principle of green chemistry and the four principles, what you call the four principles for managing and scaling sustainability, and you discussed one. And how, you know, you change the perspective from the risk area, I really like the hazard prevention and in reduction. What really impressed me in what you, you wrote, how we, we embed sustainability in the design phase and the work that, that we really need to do, how to transform, you know, the way we, we think products. And I want to ask you a bit how we can do, you know, practically, you know, because usually people, they say, okay, it's the tool, it's nice, and please read the book. Uh, I, I enjoyed reading, and you will find the link in the, in the description of the episode. But I want to ask, since you have also now tested it in many company strategy. Can you share a bit some success story? How practically does it work? And how you have translated the theory of the book in practice? Absolutely. So we have some wonderful examples that we get into the book, and I'll provide a few here. There are some firms that are doing incredible work that actually leverage our principles. If, for example, in the cosmetic space, as, as I've mentioned uh, before in other writing and in the book as well, um, there's a firm called P2 Science, um, but there are firms like that. Leading organizations in the world today actually leverage the 12 principles and, and the scorecard methodology to actually evaluate their material inputs and to understand in the design phase how they can remove reproductive toxicity effects or remove certain effects of their products in the design. So P P2 Science is a great example of a firm that actually creates entirely new chemicals and entirely new formulations uh, that are then used in the cosmetic sector at this time and hair care sector as well. So they create entirely new formulations that such that when they 
you know, eventually become cosmetics or eventually become hair care products. They are benign by design. And what I mean, what I mean by that is that they do not pose a risk to human health or the environment on use. So, and much of the makeup, as you know, today, um, so if you go on ewg.com and you search for your favorite, you know, lipstick or whatever products you use, it'll give you the effects of your daily exposure to those chemicals, right? Um, And so when we bring the scorecard into the design phase and we start designing for sustainability as a design constraint in our whole innovation process, it really helps inform a better output. Then there's from um, Erico Vodka, which is doing incredible work. Uh, They actually decarbonize by way of their technology. They developed entirely new technology to remove 13 pounds of uh, carbon dioxide from the air through the life cycle of their process. And at this time, they produce vodka and hand sanitizer uh, was something that they developed during the pandemic, and they were able to donate it to hospital systems throughout the country. These are two examples that of firms that already leverage this science. Otherwise, there are you know, uh, there's incredible work going on in the healthcare space, for example, green anesthesia, Dr. Jody Sherman and Harriet Hoff at Yale and the University of Utah. Uh, there's Gunderson Health Systems, which is very, very well known. And I would provide that example as a firm or rather uh, of a health system that has led with their values and really looked at their health system uh, operations from a sustainability lens. And they started out with a pilot, uh, which focused on energy, and then they leveraged the benefits and the profits that they realized by way of their initial sustainability investment uh, to cascade into future projects. So those are just a few examples of the firms that that leverage the scorecard. And they are wonderful example. I mean, in the book, I, I enjoyed so much. There was one also about, you know, the coffee, uh, the caffeinated coffee. I didn't know that for the uh, removing caffeine in the coffee, you have chemicals. And so that's why, you know, I better stop the caffeinated coffee. And the exposure that we have, and especially I really like what you put from the health point of view and the environmental point of view. We are exposing ourselves to many problematic chemicals to fulfill some needs, which sometimes are unnecessary. Or they've, and that's why how the scorecard can help and the example you've given us to transform and really remove the hazard that they are embedded in these products and the work we are doing. And now this leads to the question, I mean, People are listening. People usually, maybe they are managers, they are people that are interested in sustainability. Maybe they lead teams or they lead small farms and they want to know, hey, okay, fair enough. But in the last part of the book, you tackle this way, how we can strategically embed sustainability in our farms? You know, you talk about design, leadership, strategy, how me I can do in my farm? Embedding sustainability in, in a farm is actually a unique, use case that I don't believe we've discussed thoroughly enough in the book. So we do focus on firms. And um, so when we think about sustainability as a firm, what we really advocate for is to embed sustainability into your corporate strategy. So what happens then is that typically firms will embed sustainability into their marketing, you know, and, and then it becomes and and that is important. Um, it's important for executives to make audacious claims. It's important for them to provide their employees and also externally their customers a, a north star and to help them understand where the firm is going. So that marketing component is important. But when sustainability gets owned by a marketing department, it ends up getting siloed. Uh, And the same happens when um, it's treated as the risk management function. And again, risk management is important. Compliance is incredibly important. But at the end of the day, uh, again, it'll end up becoming siloed if it is not owned directly by the CEO's agenda, by a strategy and planning work group or committee, the stage where the world is right now in sustainability, I would almost advocate for not having a sustainability department at this time, rather having sustainability owned um, by 
the C-level executives at the top to ensure that top-down messaging and to ensure that the that it flows through all segments of the company and to be mobilized, of course, at the grassroots level to create that effective action. Another thing I would say is uh, to embed sustainability into corporate strategy is to actually leverage it as a design constraint. And so what I mean by that is that when treated as just another line item, by strategy and planning, or it's treated as just another line item by the innovation group, it becomes something that you are designing for, or you are designing things out. Um, but, but it is not a separate checklist that once you've designed something, you must also make sure that it fulfills another set of criteria before it is released into the market. So having it embedded in the design phase as just another line item, as another product spec or you know, certain product specs that shouldn't exist, we advocate for that being the way to go. I really like the holisticness of the model, you know, how we can put together. Now you embed sustainability really from the beginning, from the first step, not just at the end of the process or a nice to be, or even some opportunistic utilization of sustainability, like from just the marketing team, not just embedded, as you say. And this is the way, you know, to bring up what you call the unexpected solution in planning for the work. It's really interesting. And um, on how we can work and discuss. And then I want to ask you this. You have launched the scorecard. And what is the way forward of, uh, of you? And also, you know, we can shed a bit of light of the work of the Sustainability Center in Yale. Where do you want to take it, uh, the work that uh, you are doing? The work of sustainability, I would say, uh, globally has just started. And so specifically what we'd like to do with the book is hope that organizations globally embed it. Um, and so I welcome other leaders to chat with us um, and understand how we can specifically help them solve their problems uh, and their biggest challenges. Otherwise, in the future, we hope to have a trade association and a fund that actions our principles. Of course, some time to go on that. Um, but I hope that in the meantime, we can connect with leaders and help them innovate um, help startups embed sustainability into their, their innovation process and help leaders critically think about their biggest challenges and how they can incorporate sustainability into the solution. Looking at the chemicals part, that, which really also affected me when I was reading the book, is such important and it's such a, have a big impact in our environment, in our life. And since we are approaching the end, I want to ask you, Urbasi, the final call to action to the people are listening to us, your final message. I would say that any leader anywhere is designing the future. Uh, you are not just doing your job today, but you are in effect creating the future for your kids and your community. And so every action that you take today, I encourage everyone to think about the products and the processes that they're a part of today and how they can influence a better downstream effect for those products and processes uh, by way of their everyday action and their everyday leadership. Thank you so much, Urvasi. It's, it's a wonderful uh, message and I hope who is listening is following up. Follow the link for the book. It's worth reading and I enjoyed it. And I thank you so much to you and Paul for the opportunity you know, and for the wonderful job that you are doing. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Are you satisfied after this wonderful episode? Let's continue together our sustainability journey.